Are you all interested in a painting tutorial, let's say every Wednesday or Thursday? Well, I am actually thinking of putting together a tutorial every Wednesday or Thursday, and it really depends on my schedule. But this is going to be the first one, and it is how to paint two cranes in watercolor, Asian style. Now, I am living in Korea. I've been in Korea for a long time, but this is more like Japanese art, although a lot of cranes are very, um, they have a lot of symbolism here in Asia. So the crane is symbol, uh, mm, I'm sorry, the crane is symbolic of longevity and probably several other things, but uh, I'll talk about that in a minute. So let's talk about how I'm creating this. So you saw me make two little dots on the left and the right, and I'm going to be doing a triangle kind of shape. The third dot is just off of the paper at the lower side, so now I'm going to connect the dots that I imaginarily drew. And it just looks better if I do it with a, with a ruler. My lines are, by the way, very light so that I can erase them later. And right now I'm trying to decide, you know, how wide that fan is going to be. Now the fan is very typical in Asian art. And in places like China, Korea, and Japan particularly, they had a lot of fans for the nobility. It was a sign of status. And on their fans they would paint birds and uh, all of these animals and birds and symbols, flowers, would symbolize some kind of wealth nobility or wish. And that is what these cranes are doing. They are the symbol of longevity. Okay, let's talk about how to draw this bird. So the crane that I just drew was, I, I did a V. The back line of the V is a little bit shorter than the forward line and then I did three little arches get, getting larger to make the wings. The body itself is going to be rather flat when the bird flies. It's very flat in the air. It's very long and in, uh, kind of very thin. The neck will be long and then you're going to have kind of an oval for the head, very small oval, and then just a straight line for the bill or the beak. Out of the little tail feathers, there's just going to be two lines for legs and there'll be a little curl at the end where the feet are curled up when they fly. The cranes are very slim in the sky and that's what you're painting. Slim birds. Very elegant lines. Okay, now the second one is going to be kind of in the foreground. It's going to be near, so you're going to paint it larger. The V is upside down and it's going to be at a 90 degree angle. And again, the body is very, very flat. So the body is going to be much longer because the wings are a little bit larger on this bird. When you do the oval head, you need to consider um, the line beneath, okay? So you're going to change that line. You don't want the end of the, be the beak to be tangent with the fan, the edge of the fan. Otherwise, you're going to have a very ugly picture so you want there to be, you know, overlap of the legs hanging off of the fan and the beak to be positioned beyond the fan. It will just add so much more interest. And the same with the wings. The tip of the wings are going to be a little bit overlapping, so they're kind of flying off of the fan. Very much like before, you're just going to do some round scoops to meet the end of the wings, but this time the wings are not going to be as pointed. The neck will be a little bit thicker also. The head is round or oval. And then there's just one line out for the bill, I mean the beak. And again there will be two legs coming out behind and these are going to be longer legs. Remember this crane is flying closer to us. And that's it. You have drawn two cranes now. I'm cleaning up some of those lines. 
the pencil I'm using, it's a credit color, and the pencil itself is going to kind of disappear into the background. I don't have to uh, erase these colors, but I don't want extra lines to be there. I just want it to be as neat as possible. So just touch up a little bit and then you'll be fine. And now I'm making sure where my outer lines are. Okay, so I have three brushes for this paint, and this is a size 4 Aquarelle. It's Princeton, and it's a flat. It holds a lot of water, and with a flat, I can get corners easily, I can get points, I can get very fine detail. And I need a lot of water because I have to dampen this paper at least two times. And I'm putting a lot of water down, smoothing it out, it's going to soak into the canvas and then I will dampen it again with probably just as much water. I'm just very carefully going around where I want to put in some color. So I'm going to be dropping in some color in this wet area. It's called wet and wet painting. If you dampen areas beyond, then your color is going to bleed beyond your lines. And that's why I'm being very careful where I'm dampening the paper. In this particular area, it's kind of between the V of the wings, and so there's going to be a little bit of fan showing from behind, so I need to dampen that very carefully. Kind of detail work. And again, I'm dampening. This is the second time. And I just put water over the legs. It doesn't matter. I can paint over them. I'm going to make them dark anyway, so it doesn't matter if I put paint on them. And you'll notice that I didn't dampen the entire fan. There's two areas that are segregated, and I'm saving those to paint later because the, the canvas or this paper dries so quickly. So I need to put down the color while there's still a sheen of water on the surface. You don't want puddles of water. You want a sheen of water. Yes, I'm still dampening the paper. <laughs> Takes a lot of time. And there's the sheen. But it's not a consistent sheen, so over on the right side you can see that I needed to put a little bit more you know, water down. The water is going to be the carrier of the pigment. And now I'm dropping in. This is Verona Gold Ochre. And all of my colors except one are Daniel Smith. I just like Daniel Smith. I choose light, light, fast colors. And the reason I chose this color is it's a very, very light color. So we in watercolor, we start with lights and we go dark. So this underpainting will be quite light, and because there's so much water with this, uh, this pigment, it will not show up that much. So I'm being a little generous with the pigment, but it's still going to come up quite light. Also, you need to know when you're painting, you need to understand the characteristics of all of the paints. They are all uniquely different. This is an ochre, and the ochres don't move as easily in the water. They're a little bit heavier. And I'm having to actually push this around. It's not one that bleeds out in wet areas. A little bit, but I have to push the, the pigment where I want it. And you can see that it's a little bit blotchy, maybe, with the pigment. I wasn't really particularly careful about, you know, making a smooth background. That's okay. This is going to have other colors dropped in, and you want characteristics of shadow and color. And these 
This color is Rose Dory. It's Windsor and Newton. It's the only Windsor and Newton I have in this palette. I love the color. It's very soft. It's kind of a very soft rose. It's not a loud color at all. And I actually have to really work at it to get pick up color. But it makes a very nice soft blur of color in the background. And so these are kind of like the impression of cherry blossoms. And by the way, this particular painting, it could be Chinese, Korean, or Japanese, but it's actually a little bit more Japanese style. They do a lot more with crane paintings, uh, but just the colors that I chose. Kind of a green yellow. This is actually yellow. It's a gold ochre, but it turned out a little bit a little green in this painting. I don't know why. It has to do with, you know, the way my colors show up in the screen. But these colors are, and the style that I did, is rather Japanese. A lot of it has to do with the cherry blossoms. Sakura, meaning cherry blossoms, is the is the Japanese national flower. And like I said, I live in South Korea. The national flower here is the Mugunghwa, or we say the Rose of Sharon. And back in 1910 to 1945, Japan controlled Korea. And Korea was a colony of Japan. Most pe Maybe some people don't know that. And so, during that time period, the Japanese forced Koreans to plant a lot of the cherry blossoms, or the cherry trees, all over the country, in the mountains, everywhere. And they were forbidden to paint, uh, I'm sorry, they were forbidden to plant the Mugunghwa, the Rose of Sharon, because it was a symbol of their own nationality. And so for 35 years, it was a little bit um, rough. You know, living under the thumb of a very powerful country. But anyway, that's why we have a lot of cherry blossoms now in Korea, because Japan brought them during that colonial period. And, you know, at one time they were not appreciated, but now they are. And, you know, the feelings of coldness between Japan and Korea are virtually gone. So now... I let my underpainting dry, and you can see that it, there's a lot of texture there. And there's a little bit of blur from the Rose Story, Windsor and Newton. And now I'm taking a little bit more Windsor and Newton. And with a higher concentration, putting little dots down to make five petal circles like cherry blossoms. And not everywhere, just some places. You see me or you saw me put down three puddles of paint, and they all have a little bit different content of pigment. The bottom one has just a touch of pearline red, which is a very loud red. Just a hint, because when I mixed it, it was overpowering, but I do want a few petals that has a little bit of a stronger red in it. Not much, just a hint. And right now I'm using that, the red that has the pearling in it, or the, right there. It's kind of an impressionistic style. I'm painting very small. This is a 5x7, a little bit larger than a postcard, but, you know, this is just a small tutorial, so I don't need to you know, paint large. So I'm just painting Impressionism right now. This particular color is now a blend of the colors that I have used so far. I believe it is the Verona Gold with a little bit of the Rose Dory and maybe uh, it might have a little bit of Quin Gold in it. Quin Gold is a very warm gold and it really brings more depth to this because if you just have the Verona Gold, which is kind of a soft, muted color, 
then things will look kind of pastel, but that cream gold on top actually adds depth and it complements the reds very beautifully. And now I'm just kind of outlining a little bit. So in areas where there's going to be a lot of flowers underneath, then I will outline with a pink. And if there are just, you know, like the gold ochre underneath, then I'll probably use more of the Quinn Gold mixture. I do want to create a little bit of variety. And that's a little Quinn Gold that I'm just dotting in here and there to add a little more texture. And this is Quinn Gold. I think it also has a touch of the Rose Dory in it. And I'm trying to get a little bit of stim work just for a different feeling of texture. And by the way, notice in the upper right hand corner there is the final picture. That is the original picture taken with my phone and then the picture on the left is with my computer screen. So you'll notice that the colors are quite different. The one in the upper right hand corner is much, much more realistic. But like I said, that greenish color is a very Japanese choice of color. And here I'm just outlining a little bit. I am using a mixture of the Quinn Gold, Verona Gold, and Rose Dory. There might be just a hint of a pearling red, but I'm not sure about that. I'm just outlining not everything, just some things. And this particular color that I'm wiping in right now does have the pearling. It's much darker. It has a brownish appearance, and that's because of the pearling in reaction to the Quinn Gold. Now on the top, I am putting in a lighter color, and that's going to be more of the Quinn Gold, and underneath I will have more of the red, which will have, mix, mixing that Paraline Red with the Quinn Gold will have a browner look, and that's more appropriate to put underneath, as if it's a shadow. And yes, I just outlined the birds, which is not a problem. I want them to pop, you know, because they're going to be white, against the colored background. This color that I'm using for the legs is Moon Glow and Payne's Gray mix, both of them Daniel Smith. Moon Glow has more of a purple color and Payne's Gray is kind of a blue-gray, and so mixing that purple and the gray gets a pretty dark color. I don't want black, and I don't actually have black in my palette. I probably should get some. And I'm putting a little bit of black on the edge of its tail feathers, and also the neck. Now, when you're doing the neck, make sure you put in angles. You don't want to do straight up and down lines. If you put in angles, you'll have a much more attractive and elongated appearance for your crane. Now, the crane does have a black swath, or you know, black, black feathers, on the underside of the nearest of its feathers. Not all up and down, not all of the feathers just the ones that are kind of in, like we would say, maybe the armpit. The eye is not oblong, or it's not slanted. It is a perfect dot. So do your best to just put a dot in there, kind of in the middle of the head. You might want to wait on that because I do end up painting over that with some white gold. So you can paint in your eye later.
right now I'm using a Gansai Tambi, I think that's the name of it. Um, it's a six colors of gold. I'm using three of the colors in this painting. The three colors that I'm using are going to be red gold, champagne gold, and white gold. And right now I am dropping in little bits of white gold just to add some interest and to grab back some of the white. The cherry blossoms are not really pink. They have a lot of white on them. So to make it less to make it a little bit more realistic, I'm adding some white, and it does add so much interest to this, especially with the white birds nearby. This outline right now is with the red gold, and I'm doing a little bit of lace work with the red gold. I just think it adds more interest to the overall painting. Just have a little bit more texture or body on the side. It gives the fan kind of a completer look. I was using a very fine nail brush, like fingernail brush that I got at the dollar store for that fine detail work. And I'm trying to check out the brush I'm using right now. I'll tell you in a minute if it's still... No, this is the size 4. This is my favorite brush. It is a silver black velvet size 4. I like, my favorite size is size 8, but the 8 is way too large for this painting. And the 4, these brushes have very, very sharp points. And they're soft. They move so well. Uh, some people don't like them because they are very flexible. But that's my style. And right now you'll see me, I'm just lightly brushing the tip of that canvas to get that fine line. Otherwise, it will come out in a kind of a glob of paint, and I don't want that. So now to create a little bit of a darker color, I've mixed the Verona Gold, the Quinn Gold, a little bit of the Rose Dory. There might be a touch of Perylene Red in there, and there's a little bit of Moon Glow or Payne's Gray, or maybe yeah, there's a mixture. So I put down some little gray streaks there on the edge of the palette. And as I needed to mix, I just touched in a little color gradually because those are really loud colors and they'll darken the paint mixes too quickly if you go too fast. And right now I am doing, I'm sorry my hand is in the way, but I'm doing stylized Asian clouds. And Asian clouds are just swirls. They swirls go in one direction, and the swirls go swirls grow go in another direction. And they're very attractive. And oftentimes, there's little points where the the cloud will start, and it will end with a point. I didn't make any of those myself, but I was thinking it looked kind of flat just to have a a painting with too much dead space all around it, so I had to add just a little bit of interest. I believe the color I'm using right now is the Champagne Gold of the Gansai Tambi. And after I do my little swirls here and swirls there, then I will fill in some of that area with the white gold, and that will give it a lot of shimmer. Now notice where I'm starting the loops. I did not start at the tip of the wing. I want the tip of the wing to be framed. I don't want to compete with it. And I want it to be elegant, so I'm not going to put any design immediately near. So there we have a little bit of an Asian cloud. To get the thick and the thin, like I said, 
I push on the brush and then I lift. So right now I'm pulling it and when I do part of it, you can see it's thicker. A lot of that thickness is coming because I'm pushing the brush too. So when you push it, you're pushing color onto the onto the canvas, but when you pull it, you're dragging and just leaving a possibly a very thin line. And right now, I am putting in the Gansai Tambi white gold. So I'll eventually put some white gold inside the cloud. And I'm painting all of the wings, all the white parts of the crane with the white gold. And I noticed I had a little bit of a blur, a little stain of color. This white gold is opaque and it will cover any kind of mistake that you have. I'm also trying to stay inside of the line. I'm pushing the white gold right up to the edge of the line, but I'm still trying to retain it just because it, the wings looked much better, I think, if there's just a faint line. And to get this rich color down, I'm having to put down two layers, and in some areas I'll put down three, of the white gold. The first layer covers very nicely, but it's still, you can see some like transparent, like little mistakes or smudges, or maybe it's just not solid white. So if I put down two layers, then it looks so much better. Remember, you're not going to paint the neck or the tail feathers. You're just going to paint the head. And right here, I'm going over that dotted eye. It's okay. I'll paint it in again. So much easier than trying to paint around the dot. Oh my goodness, that would be really hard. Okay. Pulling the brush down, trying to get little detail work. And again, this particular brush is the dollar store nail brush. I actually got, I think, four or five or six in a package for $2. 2001, but $2. Amazing! And they last quite a long time. I can get such fine detail with them. I'm so happy to find them. And my dollar store is hit or miss. Some weeks they'll have, you know, really nice nail brushes and then for two or three or four months there's nothing. So I did get a couple packages. That's pretty good. That'll last me actually quite a long time. And I want these lines, especially those straight lines, to be very long and elegant. So I'm spending a lot of time dragging and getting that tip of the wing rather perfect, if possible. And now picking up some of that white gold and painting parts of the inside. I do overlap some of the gold and I'll retrieve the gold again. I'll paint over those lines just so that they pop. In some areas I and more careful in other areas, I do just put down a lot of paint at one time and then I'll worry about retrieving the gold later or painting over the gold later. And there you can see a bit of shimmer on the wings. It's looking good. It's actually looking very Asian, and I'm liking it. Okay, you saw me paint this before, just being a little, somewhat careful. I don't really have to stay in the lines on this one because the white and the white gold and the champagne gold, they're not strikingly different. 
in color. So if I paint a little bit over one and I don't, you know, clean up that line later that I painted over, it's fine. You're not going to really see the glaring, dif you know, the differences or the mistakes that you make. If it was with a navy or bright red, oh my goodness, it would be quite apparent and I would be much more careful. Well, this is looking pretty good. I'm thinking I do need a little bit more contrast. It's a white background and I do want to put a little bit of contrast between the white and the soft color of my fan. I can't be sure at this exact second what those colors are, but I'm going to guess that they are the Quinn Gold with a little bit of pearling red and probably a touch of Payne's Gray and or Moon Glow. So as we wrap up this painting, let me share a few quick tips on the crane itself, some cultural notes. Uh, the crane is a symbol of happiness and eternal youth in Asia, particularly in Japan. And in Japan, it's very mystical. It symbolizes fortune, good fortune, and longevity, as I already said. In Japan, not so much Korea that I know of, um, there is a fable that the crane will live for a thousand years. And that is why a lot of the Japanese, for many years, centuries perhaps, have folded a thousand cranes. Symbolism with numbers in Asia is very important. So there's a new kind of belief or myth attached now to the crane, and the crane is now seen as a symbol of peace in Japan particular, particularly. And this is the result of World War II and the dropping of the bomb on Hiroshima. A young girl was dying from leukemia after the bomb was dropped, she wanted to fold a thousand cranes with origami. And so she set about doing it. And I think she did that before she died at the age of 12. And because of her great wish to fold those cranes so that she could make her wish on the great crane that would allow her to make a wish, this also became known as, or she became known as a heroine. She's lauded today. She's famous internationally. And now because of her effort of holding the cranes, the crane has taken on the symbol of a peaceful animal. And so maybe instead of doing an origami of a thousand cranes, you can paint a thousand cranes now that you know how, and you can make a wish for longevity and peace. Well, I don't know if it'll come true, but anyway, it's, it's a thought. Well, anyway, I hope you enjoyed this painting and you learned something culturally also. We will come back next Wednesday or Thursday, depending on my schedule, for another very short painting tutorial.